Um, Linda, you, you ready to go? You need a break? Okay. Anyone need a break? It's going to take me about 20 minutes. All right. If you do, during the course of my instructions, uh, we'll start and take a break. Chair, can you pass these written instructions out, please? Folks, um, I'm going to, I'm fighting a cold, so I apologize for my voice, but um, I'm going to read these instructions to you. Um, I spent some time at length writing them out for you. Um, the law is uh, precise, and I have to be precise, and so I can't just sit here and chat with you about it. I have to tell you in some specific terms exactly what your duties are and what the law requires. Uh, you'll carry these back to the jury room with you, and uh, if you just, soon, just listen, that's fine. If you want to read along, that's fine, too. The last page that you have, um, I hope, is the uh, jury verdict sheet, so you should have um, eight pages along with the jury verdict sheet. And you see you have a number of options there, and we're going to talk about those options as we go along. Members of the jury, all the evidence has been presented. It's now your duty to decide from this evidence what the true facts are. You must then apply the law, which I'm about to give to you, to those true facts as you find them to be. It's absolutely necessary that you understand and apply the law as I give it to you, not as you think it is or as you might like it to be. This is important because justice requires that everyone try for the same alleged crime, be treated in the same way, and have the same law applied to him or to her. The defendant, Amanda Hayes, is in a plea of not guilty to the charges of first-degree murder and accessory after the fact of first-degree murder. The fact that the defendant has been charged has no evidence of any guilt. Under our system of justice, when a defendant pleads not guilty, the defendant is not required to prove his or her innocence. The defendant is presumed to be innocent. The state must prove, you, prove to you that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based on reason and common sense arising out of some or all the evidence that has been presented or lack or insufficiency of the evidence as the case may be. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that fully satisfies or entirely convinces you of the defendant's guilt. You're the sole judges of the accuracy and the believability of all witnesses. You must decide for yourselves whether to believe the testimony of any witness. You can believe all or any part of none of a witness's testimony. In deciding whether to believe a witness, you should use the same test of accuracy and truthfulness which you use in your everyday lives. Among other things, these tests may include the opportunity of the witness to see, hear, know, or remember the facts, occurrences about which the witness has testified, the manner and the appearance of the witness, any interest, bias, or prejudice, or partiality that the witness may have, the apparent understanding and fairness of the witness, whether or not the testimony of the witness is reasonable, and whether the testimony is consistent with other believable evidence in the case. You're also the sole judges of the weight to be given in the evidence. If you decide that certain evidence is believable, you must then determine the importance of that evidence in light of all the other believable evidence in the case. There are two types of evidence from which you may find the truth as to the facts of a case, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is the testimony of one who asserts actual knowledge of a fact, such as an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a chain or group of facts and circumstances indicating the guilt or innocence of a defendant. The law makes no distinction between the weight to be given to either direct or circumstantial evidence, nor is a greater degree of certainty required of circumstantial evidence than of direct evidence. You should weigh all the evidence of the case. After weighing all the evidence, if you're not convinced of the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant not guilty. You may find that a witness is interested in the outcome of this trial. Uh, you may take the witness's interest into account in deciding whether to believe the witness. If you believe the testimony of the witness in whole or in part, you should treat what you believe the same as any other believable evidence. In this case, you've heard evidence from witnesses who have been tendered as experts. An expert witness is permitted to testify in the form of an opinion in a field where the witness reports to have some specialized skill or knowledge. As I've instructed you, you're the sole judge of the credibility of each witness and the weight to be given to the testimony of each witness. In making this determination as to the testimony of an expert witness, you should consider, in addition to the other tests of credibility and weight, the witness's training, qualifications, and experience, or lack thereof, the reasons, if any, given for the opinion, whether the opinion is supported by facts that you find from the evidence, whether the opinion is reasonable, and whether it's consistent with other believable evidence in the case. 
You should consider the opinion of an expert witness, but you're not bound by it. In other words, you're not required to accept an expert witness's opinion to the exclusion of the facts and circumstances disclosed by other, other testimony. I further instruct you that proof of motive for crime is permissible and often valuable, but is never essential for conviction. If you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime charge, the presence or absence of motive is, Im is immaterial. Motive may be shown by facts surrounding the act, if they support a reasonable inference of motive. Of motive. When that's proven, motive becomes a circumstance to be considered by you. The absence of motive is equally a circumstance to be considered on the side of innocence. I also instruct you that if you find from the evidence that the defendant has admitted a fact relating to the crime charge in this case, you, sh you should consider all the circumstances under which the admission was made in determining whether it was truthful admission and the weight you will give to it. The defendant has been charged with first degree murder. Under the law and the evidence in this case, it's your duty to return, return one of the following verdicts. Guilty of first degree murder or guilty of second degree murder or not guilty. First degree murder is the unlawful intention kill, intentional killing of a human being with malice and with premeditation and deliberation. Second degree murder is the unlawful killing of a human being with malice but without premeditation and deliberation. As to this charge, the state relies upon the legal theory of acting in concert, which is recognized and accepted as part of the law of North Carolina. Under that law, for a person to be guilty of a crime, it is not necessary that she herself personally do all the acts necessary to constitute that crime. If two persons act together with a common purpose to commit the crime of first degree murder, and each is present at the time that first degree murder is committed, then each of them is held responsible for the acts committed by the other done in the commission of that crime. The state contends and the defendant denies that the defendant acted in concert with Grant Hayes in the killing of Laura Ackerson. For you to find the defendant guilty of first degree murder, the state must prove five things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, the state must prove that the defendant acting in concert with Grant Hayes intentionally and with malice killed Laura Ackerson. Malice means not only hatred, ill will, or spite, as it's ordinarily understood, but it also means that condition of mind which prompts a person to take the life of another intentionally or to intentionally inflict serious injury upon another that proximately results in another person's death without just cause, excuse, or justification. Or to wantonly act in such a manner as to manifest depravity of mind, a heart devoid of a sense of social duty, and a callous disregard for human life. Second, the state must prove that the defendant's act was the proximate cause of the victim's death. The proximate cause is a real cause, a cause without which the victim's death would not have occurred. Third, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to kill Laura Ackerson. Intent is a mental attitude, seldom provable by direct evidence. It must ordinarily be proved by circumstances from which it may be inferred. An intent to kill may be inferred from the nature of the defendant's act, the manner in which the assault was made, and the conduct of the parties, and, and any other relevant circumstances. Fourth, the state must prove that the defendant acted with premeditation. That is, that the defendant formed the intent to kill the victim over some period of time, however short, before the defendant acted. And fifth, the state must prove that the defendant acted with liber deliberation, which means that the defendant acted while the defendant was in a cool state of mind. This does not mean that there had to be a total absence of passion or emotion if the intent to kill was formed with a fixed purpose, not under the influence of some suddenly aroused violent passion, it is immaterial that the defendant was in a state of passion or excited when the intent was carried into effect. Neither premeditation nor liberation is usually susceptible of direct proof. They may be proven by proof of circumstances from which they may be inferred, such as the lack of provocation by the victim, the conduct of the defendant before, during, and after the killing, the manner in which or means by which the killing was done, and any ill will between the parties. Second degree murder differs from first degree murder in that neither specific intent to kill, premeditation, nor deliberation is a ne necessary element. For you to find the defendant guilty of second degree murder, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, acting in concert with Grant Hayes, unlawfully, intentionally, and with malice, wounded the victim, thereby approximately causing the victim's death. So I instruct you that if you find from the evidence, beyond a reasonable doubt, that on or about the alleged date of July 13th of 2011, the defendant acting in concert with Grant Hayes, 
with malice, kills the victim, thereby approximately causing the victim's death, and that the defendant intended to kill the victim, and that the defendant acted after premeditation and with deliberation, then it would be a duty to return a verdict of guilty of first degree murder. However, if you do not set fine and have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, you will not return a verdict of guilty of first degree murder, but will determine whether the defendant is guilty of second degree murder. If you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that only about the alleged date, the defendant acting in concert with Grant Hayes, intentionally and with malice, wounded the victim, thereby approximately causing the victim's death, then it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of second degree murder. However, if you do not so find and have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty to the charge of murder. If you have returned a verdict of not guilty to the charge of murder, you must determine whether or not the defendant is guilty of accessory after the fact to murder committed by another person. If you have returned a verdict of guilty to either first degree murder or second degree murder, you will stop and will not address the charge of accessory after the fact. Under the law of the state, a defendant who has been found guilty of a murder cannot also be guilty as an accessory after the fact to that same murder. So let me address now the uh, second count uh, involving accessory after the fact. The defendant has also been charged with being an accessory after the fact to the first degree murder of Laura Ackerson. By a plea of not guilty, the defendant has denied each and every element of that alleged crime. The defendant by her testimony denies that she killed Laura Ackerson and denies that she knew that Laura Ackerson was dead until after the defendant arrived in Texas with Grant Hayes. The defendant contends that any act she committed which may have assisted Grant Hayes by concealing evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered or by helping dispose of parts of Laura Ackerson's dismembered body was committed by her only because of coercion and duress by Grant Hayes. By this testimony, the defendant has raised the defense of coercion and duress. In the law of this state, the defense of coercion and duress is permitted to excuse criminal acts as involuntary, but only under circumstances in which a person reasonably believes that they must commit those unlawful acts in order to avoid suffering immediate death or serious bodily injury to themselves or to some other person. The burden of proof that the defendant acted only because of duress and coercion to save herself or another person from immediate death or serious bodily injury is upon the defendant. It need not be proved beyond a reasonable doubt by her, but only to your satisfaction the defendant would not be guilty of the crime of accessory after the fact of murder if her actions were caused by a reasonable belief that she or another person would suffer immediate death or serious bodily injury if she did not commit the acts which constitute the crime charged. The defendant's assertion of coercion and duress is, is a denial that she voluntarily committed any crime. The burden re remains on the state to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. If you define the defendant guilty as an accessory after the fact of first degree murder, the state must prove two things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, as I have defined that crime, pr crime to you previously, was committed by some person other than the defendant, specifically by Grant Hayes. And second, that after that crime was committed by Grant Hayes, the defendant, knowing that Grant Hayes had committed first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, willfully, knowingly, and intentionally assisted Grant Hayes to attempt to escape detection, arrest, and punish by punishment by helping Grant Hayes conceal evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered, or by disposing of dismembered parts of Laura Ackerson's body, or both. The defendant has testified that Grant Hayes described to her that the death of Laura Ackerson was accidental. She denies that she knew that R Laura Ackerson had been murdered by Grant Hayes. A killing is accidental if it is unintentional, occurs during the course of lawful conduct and does not involve culpable negligence. A killing cannot be intentional or premeditated or culpably negligent if it was the result of an accident. When the defendant asserts that the alleged victim's death was an accident or that the defendant reasonably believed it to be an accident, these are assertions denying the existence of those facts which the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden is on the state to prove those essential elements and, in so doing, disprove the defendant's assertion of accidental death 
or lack of knowledge of an intentional killing or an intentional wounding with malice causing a death. The state must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the victim's death was not accidental and that the defendant knew that the death was not accidental before you may return a verdict of guilty of any criminal charge. So I instruct you that if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about um, July 13th of 2011, another person, Grant Hayes, committed the first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, specifically that Grant Hayes intentionally, with malice, after premeditation, and with deliberation, killed Laura Ackerson by acts of violent trauma to her body that proximately caused Laura Ackerson's death, and that the defendant knew that Grant Hayes had committed the first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, and that the defendant did thereafter knowingly, willfully, and intentionally assist Grant Hayes in attempting to escape detection, arrest, and punishment by helping Grant Hayes conceal evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered, or by helping Grant Hayes dispose of dismembered parts of the body of Laura Ackerson. Then, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of accessory after the fact of first degree murder. However, if you do not so find have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, you would not find the defendant guilty of that crime. You would also not find the defendant guilty of that crime if the defendant has satisfied you that she reasonably believed that she or another person would suffer immediate death or serious bodily injury if she did not commit the acts which constitute this crime. If you do not find the defendant guilty of accessory after the fact of first degree murder, you must determine whether or not she's guilty of accessory after the fact of second degree murder. You will recall my previous definition of second degree murder. If the state fails to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Grant Hayes committed first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, or even if the state has proven that Grant Hayes committed all the elements of that crime beyond a reasonable doubt, but has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant knew that Grant Hayes had committed first degree murder of Laura Ackerson, the defendant could be guilty of no crime greater than accessory after the fact of second degree murder. If the state proves that Grant Hayes committed murder by intentionally inflicting violent trauma to the victim, with malice, approximately causing the victim's death, and the defendant knew, knew that, um, excuse me, and the defendant knowing that, did that after knowingly, intentionally, and willfully assist Grant Hayes to attempt to escape detection, arrest, and punishment by voluntarily helping him conceal evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered, or by helping him dispose of dismembered parts of the body of Laura Ackerson or both. If you define the defendant guilty of accessory after the fact of second degree murder, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Grant Hayes intentionally and with malice inflicted violent acts of trauma to the body of Laura Ackerson that proximately caused Laura Ackerson's death, and that the defendant knew that Grant Hayes had intentionally inflicted violent acts of trauma to the body of Laura Ackerson with malice, which proximately caused her death, and that the defendant thereafter, with that knowledge, did knowingly, intentionally, and willfully assist Grant Hayes to attempt to escape detection, arrest, and punishment by voluntarily helping him conceal evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered, or by helping him dispose of dismembered parts of the body of Laura Ackerson, or both. So finally, I instruct you that if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Grant Hayes intentionally and with malice inflicted violent acts of trauma to the body of Laura Ackerson, thereby approximately causing her death on or about July 13th of 2011, and that the defendant knew that Grant Hayes had intentionally and with malice inflicted violent acts of trauma to the body of Laura Ackerson, thereby approximately causing her death, and that thereafter the defendant with that knowledge did knowingly, intentionally, and willfully, excuse me, willingly, uh, and willfully assist Grant Hayes to attempt to escape detection, arrest, and punishment by helping him conceal evidence that Laura Ackerson had been murdered or by helping him dispose of dismembered parts of the body of Laura Ackerson, then it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of accessory after the fact to second degree murder. However, if you do not, if you fail to find, have a reasonable doubt as to one more of these things, then it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty of this alleged crime. It would also be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty if the defendant has satisfied you that she reasonably believed that she or another person would suffer immediate death or serious bodily injury if she did not commit the acts which constitute this crime. So finally, members of the jury, you've heard the evidence in the case, you've heard the arguments of the attorneys. If your recollection of the evidence differs from that of the attorneys, you are to rely solely upon your own recollection. Your duty is to remember the evidence, whether it's been called to your attention or not. 
You should consider all the evidence, the arguments, the contentions, and the positions urged by the attorneys, and any other contention that arises from the evidence. The law, as you would expect, requires the presiding judge to be entirely impartial. You should not infer uh, from anything I have done or said that, that the evidence is to be believed or disbelieved, that a fact has been proven or not proven, or what your findings ought to be. It's your duty to find the true facts and render a verdict reflecting the truth as you see it. All three of you must agree on your verdict. You cannot reach a verdict by majority vote. When you have arrived at a unanimous verdict uh, as to each charge, your full person should so indicate that verdict on the verdict sheet. After you reach the jury room, the first order of business will be to select a full person. And I'm going to let you retire in just a moment uh, to begin your liberations. If you look at the verdict sheet on the last page, um, I think I ha I'll have the original here and I'll mark it original. You can see that it reads, State versus Amanda Smith Hayes, we the jury by unanimous verdict find the defendant Amanda Smith Hayes to be count one, guilty of first degree murder, or guilty of second degree murder, or not guilty of murder. And as I've instructed you, and as the verdict sheet indicates, if you find if you found the defendant guilty of murder, either of first or second degree, stop, don't answer, uh, count two. If you found the defendant not guilty of murder, you must uh, proceed on and answer count two. Count two reads guilty of accessory after the fact of first degree murder or guilty of accessory after the fact of second degree murder or not guilty of accessory after the fact of murder. Let me see the lawyers up here, please. You've been here since uh, about 2 o'clock, and so uh, there are just a couple of things that I need to put on the record that the attorneys have asked me to put on the record. It will take me about five minutes to do that. Um, a a after which time I'll, I'll bring you, don't begin discussing the case at all. Keep an open mind uh, uh, at this point. I'm not sending you out to liberate. Uh, I'm going to have you step back to the jury room just for a moment. Um, I will be submitting the case to you in probably five or ten minutes. Um, if there's any of the 12 original jurors that something's come up over the last two or three weeks that you feel like is going to prevent you from carrying out your duties and responsibilities and making this decision, you need to tell me now. Because once I release the alternate jurors, I can't bring them back. So you need to ponder that question too while if it, uh, because uh, I don't know how long it's going to take you to make a decision. Uh, we'll be in session until you do. So uh, all of you need to be prepared to finish uh, carrying out your the duty and responsibility that you agreed to. If you have anything going on in your life that wasn't going on uh, two or three weeks ago and that you're worried about now, you need to let me know that uh, before I release the alternate jurors. Um, and when you come back in, if the alternate jurors have anything in the jury room, bring them back, bring it back in with you because if I Really, y'all, you won't be going back to the jury room. Okay. Thank you very much. Just leave your notes in your chair, though, right now. Step back to the jury room just for a minute. Keep an open mind. Don't discuss the case among yourselves at all.
Jerry's absent. Um, um, does state have any objection to the charge as given? No. And I apologize, folks. Uh, the, the pattern jury um, instruction does include the language that uh, is now in the verdict sheet that I gave them, and I showed you all at the bench. I apologize that I did not. When I noticed that it wasn't in the original verdict sheet that the clerk had prepared, I instructed her to also include uh, in the verdict sheet after the uh, count one, guilty of first degree murder or guilty of second degree murder or not guilty, the language, if you have found the defendant guilty of murder, stop and do not consider count two. If you have found the defendant not guilty of murder, you must decide count two. Um, that is the law of the state, and that's how I would charge them. Ms. Uh, Ms. Guy, when you said that maybe y'all wanted to put something on the record, I'm not sure what it was. Uh, in light of the, my understanding of the case law on that issue, North Carolina is not an equipped first state. And I'm sorry? It's my understanding that North Carolina does not consider itself uh, in terms of uh, alternate counts like we have in this case where they have to choose between a camp that's, uh, that we're not an equipped for state and that uh, if the jury were unable to reach a verdict on count one but were able to reach a verdict on count two uh, then that verdict uh, would stand and I would ask the court to consider that in the way that he instructs the jury the way the verdict form and the instruction reads presently is it leads the jury to believe that they must acquit on the first count before they can consider the second count, and I, I don't believe that's consistent with prevailing law. I think they have to consider count one, and for whatever reason, if they're unable to come to some agreement there, whether it's guilty or not guilty, uh, if they come, if they're unable, to, if they're unable to reach an agreement, or they consider, that, or they have agreed that the defendant is not guilty, then they can go to count two. But it doesn't require a finding of not guilty to reach count two. As I said the other day, I think the only case that is important on that is one in which um, the, the jury actually came back and asked, said they were hopelessly deadlocked um, with regard to uh, a greater charge and asked for instruction. And the court indicated that it would be appropriate for the trial judge to uh, allow them to proceed to the lesser charge. And if the jury comes back and tells me that they're hopeless they're deadlocked on one of the greater charges, um, I'll consider any requests that you make uh, to allow the jury to um, move to another charge. But I'm not going to put that in the instruction. Otherwise, a jury could just, for after 10 minutes, say, well, we can't agree on first, and then go to second, and then after 10 minutes, they could say, well, we can't agree on second, and we'll go to to uh, accessory after and first, and after 10 minutes, they decide we couldn't agree on that, and uh, get all the way down to the bottom of the verdict sheet in no time at all. Um, I don't think that's what the legislature or the laws of the state anticipate. So I note your request. It's denied. But if they tell me they're hopelessly deadlocked on a, on a more serious charge and ask for instruction, I will consider uh, any requests that you make about allowing them to move from that charge to another one. All right. Anything else? What was the aggravating factor? It's not in front of me, but it's um, <clears throat> that the criminal activity occurred in front of the victim's children. It, was a, it wasn't a statutory uh, aggravating factor. It was um, under the last category. Is that an aggravating factor that you contend applies to the homicide charge only? I don't know of any evidence that the um, 
that any act of being accessory after occur occurred in the presence of the children. Disposal of dismemberment of that body inside that apartment um, on between July 13th and July 16th. I don't know if there's any evidence of any of the acts occurred in the presence of any of the children, but. Uh, uh, I just let the uh, the audience, uh, go home and be instructed not to discuss the matter and be available to come back for any further proceedings that, that may be necessary. Is there something else that you want me to do with them? If I may be heard briefly, uh, based upon the argument Ms. Holt made to the jury concerning the defendants having exercised her right not to uh, make a statement to the police officers, I would make a motion for a mistrial. I don't wish to be heard on it, but I believe that she argued that the defendant was in the police car with a Kinston police officer and that she had every opportunity to tell the Kinston police officer whatever she wanted to tell her, tell him or her, and that she did not do that. You want to that motion was denied? Thank you. Uh, it's clear to me that she, she, her argument was that if the defendant was um, acting under duress, as she by her, uh, her defense under duress claim, that she had every opportunity at, at an early time to let the officers know of her concern for her own safety and the safety of her children, and she failed to do that. I don't think that uh, that in any way uh, um, required that she uh, she admit or acknowledge that she she committed any crime uh, in order to let uh, the officers know that she was in fear of her life and in fear of her the life of her children. So, and Your Honor, I would like to. Um, for the record, um, that, that dealt with the July the 22nd involving the search warrant. It was not at the time of arrest. That, that's when um, the arrest was two days later. So this was... Um, I understand that. I, I understand that. that. Okay. Um, anything else? All right. Well, let's see if how many jurors we've got that are still prepared to go forward. Um, Sheriff, uh, bring the jury in, please. We're back in session. The uh, all the jurors are again present. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to submit the case to you. And I'll look. Um, are there any of the original twelve jurors uh, have some emergency come up or for any reason unable to continue uh, as a juror in the case? I feel like I should be made aware of some potential emergency that might prevent you from carrying out the rest of your duties here? If so, let me know, please. That's why we have alternate jurors. Uh, show the record that no jurors so indicated, and I accept the fact that all jurors now are prepared to go forward and carry out their responsibility.
Folks, I'm going to write original verdict sheet on the one that I have here. This is the verdict sheet that you will use in having your full person uh, record your verdict and present, presenting the verdict to the court. Your first order of business when you retire will be to select the full person to lead you in your deliberations and then discuss this as, as reasonable men, men and women, determine what you find the true facts to be, and then render a verdict that you find reflects the truth as you see it. When all 12 of you unanimously agree, follow the instructions that I've given you, and you've recorded that verdict on the verdict sheet, let us know, we'll take your verdict. Um, uh, we'll go till maybe 5.30 or so today. We'll go to when y'all want to stop, okay? I mean, you may want to stop at 5 o'clock, you may want to stop a little while later when all of you decide when you're ready to quit, uh, we'll quit uh, if you haven't reached a verdict by then. Um, we can't stay real late, but we'll stay a while. I'll kind of let you all decide what your schedule will be. Um, it, some of you have to get home uh, at, at about 5. We'll, you need to honor that that commitment with the other jurors, and we'll stop about then. So if I don't hear from you, uh, I'll just make some inquiry by probably about 5.30 or so. Uh, let the, you can take your notes with you. Uh, take all the documents that you already have with you that have been passed out. I'll let you retire and begin your liberations after you've selected a full person. Thank you very much. You may retire. Yes, sir. Uh, can we take some time to run downstairs and possibly get some uh, soft drinks and stuff to drink? Okay. If yeah, sure. Um, i tell you what. Um, I'm going to let you, do, uh, if you need to make a phone call, anything like that, I'm, I'm going to let you retire, but I have a structure not to begin deliberating until all, all, your, all 12 jurors have, are in the jury room. Let the bank know when all 12 of you are there, and then you will begin your deliberations. Um, select your full person, then begin your deliberations in the case following the instructions that I've given you. Thank you very much. You can step back to the jury room. When all 12 of you are present, you can begin deliberating. Thank you. The alternate jurors will remain. Alternate jurors remain in the courtroom, please. Thank you. Twelve original jurors have retired. Uh, the three alternate jurors, uh, uh, Mr. Sh in the courtroom. Let me see all up here.
sacrifice you've made, and it has been a sacrifice, and we all understand and appreciate that. And I, uh, um, I can't describe to you how much I appreciate your careful attention to this case as an alternate juror. It's not unusual to lose jurors during the course of a trial like this. I mean, I've tried cases in which we lost two or three jurors. So it, I actually expected that at least one of you would serve, if not all of you would serve. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, we, no one's gotten sick or ill or otherwise disqualified and we can proceed on. There's a little bit of an issue here because uh, we were talking to the bench because there is uh, there's an there's a, um, aspect of the case in which if the defendant is found guilty of any crime, then the jury will also participate in a sentencing hearing. And the question was whether or not to bring you back for that, and I've decided not to do that. Uh, the original jury, jury, if they find the defendant guilty of some crime, then they'll, they'll be asked to participate in that, and you will not be required any further to participate in this trial. If you want to take all those things you've got with you, with you, you can. If you want to leave them with the clerk, your notes, you can. Fill it with the bailiff, and she'll give them to the clerk, and we'll destroy them. That's entirely up to you. Um, the um, uh, restrictions that have been imposed on you are now lifted. You can talk to anybody you want to about this case. You can listen to anything on the radio or on TV or go on the internet and actually re-watch the trial, I suspect, if you wanted to. You could actually go on the internet and re-watch the trial if you wanted to. See every commentary you wanted to or anything else. I'm just telling you that all the things that you can't do, you couldn't do before, you can do now. If you want to talk to your neighbors about it, fine. If you don't, tell them I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but we really appreciate the careful attention you've given to the case, the sacrifice that you made, and the, the understanding you now probably better appreciate that this is democracy in its purest form when we have to make these kinds of decisions. I don't make them. You know, we've got 12 citizens that make these kind of decisions, and that's why you were here, and that's why you're asked to be here, and we greatly appreciate your willingness to do this. Um, the clerk will send you a check in a week or two, and now the check is an insult. Obviously, we, if we paid you for the value of your services, we could not afford to have you here any more than we could afford to have these kids over in uh, Afghanistan or anywhere that do their part in the democracy that we very much cherish and endure. We also are going to make some effort, Mr. Sheck, to compensate you for the inconvenience that you suffered by not having to be able to get home for a couple of days in that snowstorm. But uh, I'll be uh, addressing that issue later after the trial is over with. Uh, we thank you very much, and we'll excuse you at this time. Thank you. Hope you ha all have a good day. Folks, I'm going to wait until the bailiffs told me that we have all the jurors in the jury room, and then we'll send the uh, send the verdict sheet in, and they will begin their deliberations. We'll go to about probably 5.30 or so tonight, unless they tell me they want to go a little longer, and then we'll adjourn and start in the morning at 9.30. Oh, one thing on the record, you don't have to Sure. First, we're getting handouts of states. Is it at 2.28, 2.29, and 2.30? Um, I believe those were collected the next day, so the jurors can go back to the jury room with any of those exhibits. I think they're also handed some other handouts. I think there's one other handout by the state, one other handout by the defense, and I just want the record to reflect that those have all been taken back up by the, the deputies. All right. Got them all? Yeah. Uh, just check and see if they're all in. Okay. Well, I take it, based upon what all of you said, that if the jury asked for any item of evidence, that you will gladly consent to them having it in the jury room. Um, so we'll see if they want to see anything, and we'll see whether or not, after you see what they want to see, whether or not you will continue to gladly consent to it going back in the jury room.
worksheet and uh, in an envelope to the uh, jury. And all jurors, so she reports that all jurors are back in the jury room. We'll be at ease waiting for the jury verdict. Thank you.